It's now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Good morning, Speaker. Uh, Speaker. Speaker, you may recall that the rural municipality of Brighton, which is located in the riding of the Minister of Labour, felt that the only way to get this government's to pay attention to them was to hire one of the Premier's friends, Amin Masoudi, to lobby for them. Now, we know this Mr. Masoudi was in Las Vegas getting the massages with the Greenbelt developer and the Conservative MPP and was a guest at the Premier's daughter's wedding. Now that the government is, however, under RCMP criminal investigation, can the Premier tell us when he last spoke to Mr. Masoudi? And to reply, the parliamentary assistant, member for Brantford Brant. No, thank you, Speaker. Uh, I will repeat, uh, and as we have said many, many times to the Leader of the Opposition, the Integrity Commissioner has issued a report, the Auditor General has issued a report, our government has reversed course on a policy that was not supported by the people of the province of Ontario. We have accepted all of the recommendations that have come from that report. But what we are doing, Mr. Speaker, and what we have been doing since day one is focusing on rebuilding the province of Ontario that was left a mess by the Liberal NDP government previously. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, I mean, first of all, I got to say, I don't think that when the good people of Bradford Brandt elected that member opposite, they elected him to do that. I mean, really. Uh, but look, here's what we've noticed. Uh, there are people who matter to this Premier, and there are people who don't. People he will protect and people he won't. We know who doesn't matter to this Premier. Two and a half million people with no doctor the one in five Ontarians who can't make the rent, the one million Ontarians relying on a home care system that is in crisis. Who does matter to this Premier? Developers looking to get rich when his government removes their land from the Greenbelt, or political staffers turned lobbyists like Nico fidani Diker or Amin Masoudi, who buy a ticket to an event in the Premier's own, you know, the Premier's family's event, and then they get a ministerial zoning order or other benefits for their clients. Why won't this Premier put regular people first for once instead of his friends and donors? Please take those seats. The Premier. Mr. Speaker, I just ignore the rubbish that comes over from the, the opposition, but I'll tell you who we worry Order. about. We worry about the 16 million people that live in this province. We worried about the 300,000 people that lost their jobs under the NDP, under the Liberals. That's who we worry about. We care about the 860,000 people that are working, that weren't working under your government. Or we worry about the people that need to go to the hospital, that had run down hospitals because you never built hospitals, and we're building 50 new sites or additions and $50 billion. We're worrying about the investments that you chased out of this province, never to come back again, that we've seen close to $70 billion of investment, of $45 billion in the EV sector that's going to employ thousands and thousands of people. We're worrying about people stuck in traffic day in and Order. day out that Response. you're against building the 413 and the Bradford Bypass. We worry about people getting their doors kicked in, putting a gun to their head, that you're okay with letting these criminals out on bail early. Stop the clock. Remind the members. The member for Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. I'm going to remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Start the clock. The final supplementary. Speaker, thank you. And now that we have the Premier's attention, apparently, maybe he'll actually answer the first question I asked, which was whether or not he has spoken to Mr. Masudi or when the last time was that he spoke to Mr. Masudi. Ontarians should be able to trust that when their government decides to spend their money, that decision is based on evidence and public interest. But this Premier proudly says he doesn't care about evidence or even what the people think, as long as it apparently works for his friends, for party insiders. 
This is at the very heart of why his government is under criminal investigation by the RCMP. So I want to know from this Premier who's lobbying for the people of Ontario and do they all have to hire an insider lobbyist? Members, so please take their seats. Premier? Well, I, I, I think. I think the people of Ontario had an opportunity to speak in the by-elections. We won all three ridings. I think you came a distance there. And by the way, by the way, in the next election, we look forward to taking care of that row, that row, and that row over there, which is going to happen. Because people know life is better in Ontario than it was six years ago. Because they have certainty now. Because they have jobs now. They're bringing home a paycheck that they never had before under your left wing regime of don't build anything. Let's kill businesses. Let's all go around and hop on our bicycle and go down the crowded streets that are just absolute insanity Order. right now on Bloor, on Young, on University. No, people want reasonable judgment, and that's what we're giving the people Response. of Ontario. We're putting money back into their pockets instead of your greedy little pockets. Stop the clock. One more time. One more time, I'm going to remind the members to make their comments through the chair, and I'm going to add, uh, personal insults add nothing to the debate. Order. Start the clock. The next question, the Leader of the Opposition. I'll tell you how people, uh, Speaker, in Ontario are feeling right now after six years of this government. They're feeling stuck. They're struggling. They're stuck on wait lists. They're stuck, yes, in traffic. They're stuck with a government that isn't interested in fixing order. their problems. One the of the best to examples of this is this government's failure to deliver on public transit. There are currently at least three major transit projects right here with no opening date in sight. Eglinton LRT, Finch West LRT, your Ontario LRT, all promise to the people of Ontario, but there is no sign of when they will be open. Can the Premier tell the people of Ontario the date side, when they order. will be able to start using the public transit that they already paid for? And to apply? The premier. Sir, I thought this morning, be nice when you get in the legislature, <laughs> and I'm doing my best. But when you talk and you say, I got to watch my words here. When 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 you say they're stuck in traffic, but the same person is voting against the 413, the Bradford bypass, Highway 3, Highway 1117, the expansion on 401 East, Order. and voting against getting rid of those nasty, terrible bike lanes. Order. Secondary roads. Here, here. But again, Mr. Speaker, we're spending $70 billion on the largest transit project here. in North America to get people out of their cars, to make sure they have an equitable and reasonable uh, plan to get to work. We also did Response. the one fare that you voted against. Okay. You'd rather charge more people money so when you come in from the GO train, you stop at Union Station, you don't have to pay another fare. Or the train will take a seat. Once again, remind the members to make their comments through the chair, not directly across the floor of the House. Leader of the Opposition, supplementary. Speaker, that was a lot, but I didn't hear a date. I did not hear a date. No dates. Once again, Speaker, millions of Ontarians are working harder than ever to get through the month. They're waiting for a raise that never seems to come. And meanwhile, their Premier gives a 300% raise to his 
million dollar man, his buddy, the CEO of Metrolinx, who I just want to point out again, hasn't completed a single project on time wow. or on budget. Can the Premier explain to Ontarians who use transit and who work 12-hour days why they get nothing while the Premier's buddy over at Metrolinx gets a 300 per cent raise? Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, let's talk about that we have the highest minimum wage in the entire country because we worry about those people, how we've created the Opposition opportunity to have a bigger paycheck and a better job Opposition because we created the environment and the conditions for companies to invest here. There was over 137 companies worldwide, Mr. Speaker, that invested $11 billion that are employing 12,200 people that didn't have a job. Last year, we created more jobs here in manufacturing than all 50 U.S. states combined. That's what economic development's about, making sure you give the people a lift up, and speaking of lift up, the lift tax credit, going to the most vulnerable people out there, making sure that we have people on ODSP that are getting the rate of inflation of 5%. Putting more money into their pockets, giving them the opportunity. And yes, the people on Ontario work. Thank you. Thank you. The Premier will take a seat. Thank you. Order. The final supplementary. As a disappointing response, uh, Speaker. You know, whenever the Premier finds himself in a corner, he likes to punch down always on the most vulnerable Ontarians. It's very unfortunate and, frankly, irresponsible of this Premier. But look, another thing that really galls Ontarians, Ontarians who are struggling, and I'm going to tell you, it really drives people crazy. And, and this is hard to believe, but follow along here. There are not five, not 10, not even 15, but 82 Metrolinx vice presidents, 82 VPs, and zero opening dates. Zero opening dates, Speaker. And they just keep getting these 300 per cent raises while the Premier takes teachers and nurses and health care workers to court to freeze their wages. Why, oh why, does the Premier keep rewarding Question. Metrolinx for failing to deliver to the people of Ontario? Premier. Speaker, if the Leader of the Opposition is so concerned about this, why did she vote against the largest yeah. transit project in North America? Why did she vote against reducing the cost of fuel that we know, God forbid, which will never happen by the way, you're ever in government, you'll jack up taxes like you did before. Take money out of people's pockets. That's what you believe. You believe the government can spend the money better than the people. We don't. We believe in putting money back into people's pockets until they can go out for dinner, buy a pair of sneakers, maybe get their kids new clothes. When you, you and the Liberals were in power, they were in stress. You bankrupt this province. Companies were leaving because the environment wasn't there. High taxes, some of the highest in North America, the highest energy costs in North America, red tape and regulations. Well, my friend, we've changed all that. Response. That's why we have become an economic powerhouse around the world. People are coming here from all, the, all around the world to invest and to live and to raise a family. We had record amount of people coming here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. One more time, I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair. Remember, you're addressing the speaker. The next question, the member for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. When a government awards contracts with taxpayer dollars, it's a violation of the Member's Integrity Act to give preferential treatment to one bidder. Mm. But in awarding the Ontario Place contract to Therma, there was no fairness monitor. Therma, the Therma lease requires taxpayers to pay a billion dollars for a parking garage and to bulldoze the West Island. The bid submission deadline was extended, and one of the late bidders was Therma. A Therma lobbyist contacted the bid evaluation team during the evaluation period. A government drawing showed a Therma-like attraction on the site six months before Therma was officially awarded the contract. Wow. So wow. my question is, did this government give Therma preferential treatment? 
to reply, the Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As I said on Monday on the first day in the House, the NDP have filed a complaint. The Integrity Commissioner is reviewing that complaint, and the Integrity Commissioner was very clear with me that he did not want me to comment on this matter. Mr. Speaker, but what I will comment on is the fact that we are investing $970 million for water infrastructure projects across the province of Ontario so that people like us, their children, our neighbours, our friends, have the ability to purchase a home and live in a home in the province of Ontario. And I will continue to focus my efforts to make sure that housing is affordable in the province of Ontario. Great. Great. Uh, Supplementary question? Okay. I don't know how you pivoted from Ontario Place to, to housing, but the only housing this government's built is the tent encampments that are now in every community across this province. Look, when, you, when this government is spending tax dollars Government or side, away publicly owned property, Ontarians deserve answers. And the Thermal Lease requires taxpayers to pay $450 million for a parking garage even though the government told prospective bidders that the government would not consider proposals requiring taxpayer-funded parking. Yes or no, did Thermos' proposal require a publicly funded parking garage? Okay. I suppose I will recognize the Premier. I'll wait till the chirping stops there, Mr. Speaker. Okay, good. Thank you. You know, I wouldn't trust the NDP running a lemonade stand yep. because they end up going bankrupt. That parking that we're, we're working on right now will be the number one income generator. And by the way, no one gets it, but the people of Ontario get that income. That's the difference between how they operate and how we operate. We operate this province like a business. It will be the most profitable area of that whole complex of Ontario Place. It will be the number one tourist attraction in all of Canada. Uh, when we get completed, Opposition five to six million people will be going there every single year. And Thermay invested $700 million. It was a clean, transparent bid overseen by many authorities to make sure Response. it was clean and transparent. But they would rather leave it as a weed patch here, here. And, and be going in there and watching weed come up through the grounds. And people probably smoking weed there, too. The whole <laughs> Thank you. The next question. Order. The next question. The member order. The member for Milton. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. It feels like almost every day we hear about companies that are expanding their operations in Ontario. Compare that to when Liberals were in charge, and we would hear about companies shutting down their operations and moving out of Ontario on a near daily basis. But by reversing the destructive anti-growth policies and lowering the costs across the board, we're seeing businesses create good-paying jobs for hard-working Ontarians throughout Ontario, including my riding of Milton. Our life sciences sector is one example that has seen important growth in recent years. And last week, our government launched a plan to ensure the sector continues to grow in the years ahead. Speaker, can the minister please share with the legislator how the recently announced phase two Question. of Ontario's life sciences strategy will benefit the people of Ontario? And to reply, the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thank you very much, Speaker. You know, after the uh, success in landing $45 billion in new auto investments, we've told the life sciences sector that we are making a hard pivot now and making life sciences our focus. We launched phase two of our life sciences strategy, where we're investing $146 million to solidify the province's position as a global leader in biomanufacturing and health sciences. So far, Speaker, we've landed $5 billion in new life science investments. And since we introduced our strategy, nearly 5,000 new life sciences jobs have been created. We have an ambitious goal, Speaker, to hit 85,000 workers by 2030, a 25% increase. Speaker, with our life sciences strategy, we are ensuring that we will continue to build on the momentum you just— Thank you.
supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The life sciences sector is an immensely important industry for Ontario's economy now and in the years ahead. We want more life-saving medical breakthroughs to happen right here in our province. And with our life sciences strategy, our government is ensuring that this sector continues to grow in the years ahead. Global companies now know that this is not the same Ontario as when Liberals were in charge. Our government has created a thriving business environment, putting Ontario in a position to attract investments in every single sector, from auto to life sciences. Speaker, can the minister please share further information about the important investments that Ontario's life sciences sector has made? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, as I mentioned a minute ago, over $5 billion in new life science investments have already taken place. Last week, the Premier, Minister Jones, um, MPP Scully, we opened North America's Cell and Gene Therapy Manufacturing and AI Centre of Excellence in Hamilton at Omnia Bio. Uh, it is an $850 million investment, 250 jobs, but they told us there it's going to 500 new jobs. Sanofi, we were there for the opening of their $800 million investment. Shortly, we'll be at the opening of their $925 million investment where they'll make the seniors' flu vaccine. 1,225 new jobs. Roche, $500 million investment to open their global farm, a technical operation in Mississauga. 500 new jobs. I can go on and on, Speaker, because with our life sciences strategy, we are ensuring that there are going to be more game-changing investments. Thank you. The next question, the member for London North Centre. Thank you, Speaker. It's been two decades since Ontario said it would stop institutionalizing Ontarians with developmental disabilities. Yet in 2020, this Conservative government gave $2.67 million to a Toronto organization, Jake's House, to reinstitutionalize 30 adults with developmental disabilities inside a long-term care home in Lucan. When it opened, the Conservative MPP said, this is a model that I think will work in every community, every region across the province. My question is to the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Does this Conservative government now believe in reinstitutionalizing Ontarians with developmental disabilities? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I thank my honourable colleague for, uh, for their question. Mr. Speaker, when we announced the, our vision for the sector with our partners through Journey to Belonging, we made that very clear. That is what's driving all the efforts and our collaboration with all the family members, those with lived experience, all our partners on the ground towards that vision of journey to belonging, choice and inclusion. The member is aware of that. That's, that's why we're investing over $3.5 billion in the sector so that every single person in this province can live independently as much as possible, whatever they want, to make sure they also have the support, Mr. Speaker, in their communities. That's why we're working with all our partners to make sure that has, that has happened. Journey to Belonging is a long-term vision of us and the sector, and we're not going to at all deviate from our plan to make sure that everyone has the support in their community. Response. Every single Order. person should have the chance to succeed and thrive in our community, Mr. Speaker. And when it comes to our government, we'll do everything we can, work with our partners to make sure that happens. A supplementary question. Speaker, Ontarians with disabilities deserve better than a new institutionalization model, but this government rubber stamped it. That is not the journey to belonging. That's right. On October 3, 2024, MCCSS terminated funding for Jake's House, but there are still lingering questions. Did MCCS ever consult families and other providers? Where are the RFPs to select families to select the most skilled and capable organizations? Did any other organizations submit a proposal? Was the location even inspected before people lived there? Speaker, my question is back to the minister. Can you commit that this government will stop and forever stop the institutionalization of Ontarians with disabilities? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. 
Mr. Speaker, the member, I'll repeat again, that is the vision of Journey to Belonging. That is our vision, along with our partners on the ground, Mr. Speaker, so that everyone in this province can live the lives they choose, Mr. Speaker. Right. We're supporting them with all the supports they need, again, along with our partners on the ground, with our vision, Journey to Belonging. That's why we're investing record-breaking numbers. Mr. Speaker, investment for the developmental services sector under this government has increased by $1.2 billion since we formed government, Mr. Speaker. Now, more important, Mr. Speaker, supportive living so that people can live as independently yeah. as they, yeah. they want has increased by over order. $700 million yeah. since we formed government. Member Mr. for Speaker. Hamilton Mountain, all come to order. All of those are clear examples that we are working with all our partners to make sure they have the support, the resources they need to succeed and thrive in their communities, and they will always have the support and the commitment of this government. Mr. Right. Speaker. Yeah. Member for Hamilton Mountain, come to order. The next question, the member for Whitby. Speaking, my question is for the Minister of Energy and Electrification. Ontario is entering a period of rapid growth and transformation. We're building new homes and major infrastructure projects at a record pace. We're attracting job creating investments from global companies and leading the charge in the electrification of industries in Ontario. As a result of these investments, our electricity demand is set to surge dramatically in the coming decades. Our government has promised a comprehensive energy strategy to meet this challenge. Ontario families need assurances that our energy system will have the power to keep our electricity system running, unlike the disruptions they faced under the previous Liberal government. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how our government plans to meet the rising demand for power Question. while ensuring that energy remains affordable and reliable for all Ontarians. Good question. And to reply, the Minister of Energy and Electrification. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member for Whitby for his leadership in this House as we work together to ensure this province has the power we need to fuel our growth. Because, Speaker, we need 75 percent more power. That is equivalent to adding four and a half cities of Toronto to the grid by year 2050. And our Premier has a vision to build a clean, affordable, reliable energy future for the people of Ontario as we lean into non emitting nuclear power to drive that growth. Affordable energy that we're building on time and on budget, a rare uh, a rarity in the space, but it is our value proposition to the world. As we lead building the first G7 in the G7 small modular reactors, we lead the largest continental nuclear expansion in our history. Mr. Speaker, our focus is affordability. The Affordable Energy Act will guide the way as we lead with the largest energy expansion with a focus on affordable energy, a Response. sharp contrast to the former Liberals that increased rates by 300 percent. We're keeping rates on, power on, and more importantly, we're keeping it affordable for the people of Ontario. Supplementary question. Speaker, my supplementary is to the Associate Minister of Energy Intensive Industries. As Ontario grows, businesses, especially those in energy intensive industries, rely on stable, affordable, and clean power to thrive. Our province is pushed towards electrification, along with a significant rise in housing and industrial development means that the demand for energy will only increase. In Whitby, businesses are concerned about having consistent and affordable energy to carry out their day-to-day -day operations. Reliable and clean energy is crucial to ensuring that companies choose to invest in Ontario rather than look elsewhere. Speaker, through you to the Associate Minister, how will our government balance the need for economic growth? with ensuring that Ontario's energy supply remains reliable and affordable for all. The Associate Minister of Energy Intensive Industries. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I want to acknowledge the leadership for the member for Whitby for his advocacy on behalf of those job creators and industries from his riding. He's been a strong voice, and I want him to take back to his riding 
a message of confidence when he speaks with job creators and industry to know that this is a government and a premier that will have their back every step of the way. When you look at the track record of reducing the, gar uh, the gas tax by 10 cents a litre, when you look at the comprehensive electricity pricing plan to ensure that industry and small businesses have supports that they need to have a reliable, affordable energy, and yesterday an announcement to ensure that we have an integrated energy vision for this province, as well as on Monday, news that Minister Lecce, Minister Calandra, and myself announced to ensure that we're making it faster and cheaper and easier to connect new businesses to the grid. You can see very clearly that this is a track record of a premier and a government that wants to continue having the back of those businesses in his riding. So when the member goes back and speaks with industry, when he speaks with job creators, they can know that we have a strong plan, a confident plan to ensure that we have accessible, affordable, reliable power for many, many years to come that will, of course, be affordable and supported in every community, not just in Whitby, not just in Niagara, not just in Toronto, but in every single corner of this province. Here, here. Thank you. The next question, the member for St. Catharines. Good morning, Speaker. Thank you. In my riding, St. Catharines, we have BioLease Pharma, an oncology pharmaceutical manufacturing company that is being pushed out of Canada entirely. Why, you ask? Because they are losing RFP bids to oversee international manufacturers, some of who, whom are offering their pharmaceuticals at a higher price point. Ontarians deserve made in Ontario solutions. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Will you commit right here today to working with BioLease Pharma immediately, preventing the closures of their Ontario-based operations and protect Canadian-made products right here in Ontario? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, the member opposite raises an important point, and that is as we expand the pharmaceutical, the medical supplies, the medical equipment manufacturers in the province of Ontario, how do we ensure that we have a pathway so that they can actually make sure that those new drugs, that those emerging technologies are actually being able and offered to Ontario residents? And that's why I'm so pleased that Premier Ford has taken this on in his new leadership as head of the uh, Confederation uh, COF and ensured that we have a process in Ontario and in Canada specifically to make sure that as these emerging technologies come forward, we have a pathway for them to uh, provide those products in Canada, in Ontario. Thank you, sir. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. So I hope that means that you'll be sitting down immediately and speaking to an uh, Ontario base pharmaceutical right now in BioLace Pharma. You know, Speaker, the Premier needs to take responsibility for pro provincial procurement rules and oversight here. It's clear that this Ford government is passing the buck once again, despite constantly talking about creating real solutions right here in Ontario. Speaker, again, my question is to the Premier. Will you step up and protect good paying jobs that are already here, much needed jobs that BioLease provides in this sector. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Well, it, thank you, Speaker. That's an interesting question considering you voted against the very answer to that. We have Bobby Building Ontario Business Initiative that legislates that that 10 percent, up to 10, more than 10 percent of what we buy in the province of Ontario must be made in Ontario. That's about $3 billion a year that's being bought. Now, sadly, you voted Order. against that, and, and, and we, wouldn't have, we would not have expected anything other than that from you. But, but we can also tell you Remember we can St. also Catherine's tell you that during the pandemic, when we found that zero of our PPE was being made here domestically, we are now at at 74 percent, and when our nitro glove plant Response. opens, we will be at 94 percent, Speaker, of all PPE being made domestically, and a, a lot of. Member for St. Catharines, come to order. The next question, the member for Kingston and the Islands. Doctors came here Monday imploring the government to stop the crisis. 
They've left 2.5 million people in Ontario without a family doctor. In Kingston, the entrepreneurial CDK clinic moved ahead on its own in February, hiring staff and rostering new patients. But the result? A scramble to get in day-long lineups was called the Hunger Games of Healthcare. Besides all the people without family doctors, the problem is it's hard to pull them off the Healthcare Connect waiting list, even eight months later. Getting data should be Management 101 by a local Ontario health team, which is setting up the system to connect people to family doctors and health homes, would be helped a lot if they could know all their local people on the wait list. No private health information has to be released. When it comes to the family doctor waiting list, why can't this government help local leaders innovate and get it done instead of keeping central government control? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. You know, on Monday when I sat down with the OMA, we had a good conversation about how, in fact, Ontario is leading Canada with 90% of residents matched with a primary care provider. We know we can do more, which is why on Monday I was so pleased to be able to ask and task Dr. Jane Philpott to make sure that we continue on our path. You know, in February, when we announced 78 new primary care multidisciplinary teams, it was an exciting time for communities across Ontario, in Kingston, in Minto, Minto Mapleton, to ensure they've already hired and started to take on patients who have been looking for primary care providers, 78 across Ontario. By bringing Dr. Philpott on, we're actually going to be able to continue to work and increase that 90% number so that within Spons. five years, we will have 100% of the Canadian Ontario residents who want a family physician ha having access to it. Very Thank you. Supplementary question. The city of Kingston, hearing the people's cries and not waiting for this government to get it done, spent $1 million to recruit health care staff, including $100,000 for the Greenwood Clinic to hire RPNs and support staff and free up family doctor time. 2.5 million Ontarians don't have family doctors, and this government is only starting to ask around for help. So here's some advice. Build on local leaders in Kingston who've had success on their own. Thanks to local initiatives, Greenwood Clinic cleared the Healthcare Connect waitlist in their geographic health home on October the 8th. Why hasn't this government provided family health organizations like Greenwood funding to build up staff or add allied health professionals and connect more people to family doctors? Why should the city of Kingston have to get it done on its own? Minister of Health. And why do the independent Liberals continue to vote against our investments in primary care? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, in addition to the 78 new and expanded primary care multidisciplinary teams, we also invested $20 million funding to boost existing teams because we know that we have exceptional world-class clinicians in the province of Ontario who want to provide care in their communities. And they have a government who's going to get it done. Whether it is expanding primary care, whether it is new medical schools in Brampton and in Scarborough and in the York Region. Independence come to order. Every single medical school in the province of Ontario having additional access and medical seats and residency seats. Northern Ontario School of Medicine has over almost 50% increase in their medical seats. Why do we do that? Because we do that because we know Independence when we come train to order. Ontario students in Ontario, they stay, they practice, and we become the beneficiary. Next question, the member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Agribusiness. Speaker, we know the European Union represents one of the world's largest and most developed markets, with 27 countries and a population of over 447 million people. Given the increasing global demand for reliable, safe, and high-quality agri-food products, Ontario must remain a key player in these markets. And Minister, your recent visit to, to the EU comes at a critical time as the European Union is looking for dependable trade partners. Mm. Strengthening these relationships is critical 
to ensuring that Ontario farmers, like those in my riding, and agribusinesses across the province continue to grow their exports. Mm -hmm. Speaker, will Question. the minister please share with us the specific outcomes from this trip and the connections he made that will help our agricultural sector? Minister of Agriculture, Food and Agribusiness. Well, thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Hastings, Lennox, and Addington. We were there this summer, along with the member from around from Nipsey and Pembroke, for a great beef barbecue for the Hastings beef farmer. So well done. Um, first of all, let me thank the Grain Farmers of Ontario, Speaker. They were on this mission. They did a great job. Uh, in particular, I want to thank Jeff Harrison, the chair of the GFO, and thank uh, Crosby Devitt, the CEO. They represent 28,000 uh, grain and oilseed producers in the province. 6 million acres of corn, soybeans, wheat, barley, and oats. Um, they did a great job. Uh, actually, Speaker, when you combine the EU with the UK, we're looking at a market of 520 million people, um, a great opportunity for agri-food producers in this pro province because they are importers of ag commodities and food. In an uncertain world, yes, reliable, stable, and, and uh, high-valued commodities and food are asked Spons. for by this mar market. Uh, we're going to reinforce, we're going to engage, and we're going to explore these markets on behalf of all of our farmers. We're getting it done. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. It is an increasingly competitive global market, and it's clear that collaboration with our international partners and policymakers is absolutely crucial. The European Union is seeking to secure reliable, long-term food, food chain relationships, and Ontario's agriculture sector is ready to meet that demand. Ontario has a unique opportunity to leverage our strengths and expand our reach across Europe, building on the momentum of your recent trip. Supporting Ontario's agriculture, agribusiness champions at events like the SIAL Agricultural Show in Paris is essential for gaining visibility and establishing these new partnerships. So, Speaker, would the minister please explain how his meetings in Brussels and in Paris will help to strengthen Ontario's agri-food sector over the long term? Once again, the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Agribusiness. Thank you, Speaker. The big takeaway in the EU is motivated to both protect and strengthen uh, their food supply. And when you think of Ontario, Speaker, in 2023, we exported $26.2 billion out of this province, up 65 per cent since 2018. Um, well, in Europe, we met with Ambassador Ailish Campbell, special, uh, um, Ambassador to Belgium, Special Envoy to the EU, and Ambassador to France, the Honorable Stefan Dion, and their trade representatives. And I can't say enough about them, how they helped us access stakeholders, helped us meet with new and emerging market customers. Uh, they opened doors and did a really, really good job. Um, we attended CL, the largest food show in the world, met with some potential investors. I look forward to working with the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade to ensure that we capture these markets for this province. Response. Most importantly, met with customers that are already doing business in the EU, like Hensel District Co-op, like uh, Beretta Farms. We're creating the environment for our people to succeed. We're getting the job done. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question to the Premier. Last week, in a landmark case, the Ontario Court of Appeal found that global heating is risking the lives and well-being of the people of Ontario. Young people, led by Sophia Mathur from Sudbury, brought this case to, protect, to press his government to protect us all. Will the Premier finally put in place a plan and a target to help protect people from the climate crisis? The Acting Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. And I'm proud to be the alternate Minister of the Environment, Conservation, Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks while Minister Kanjin is on parental leave. We are taking action on climate change. We are proud to lead the way in Ontario for Canada's progress. Ontario's leadership under this Premier is responsible for 86 per cent of our progress toward tackling climate change. So as the Government of Canada is set to miss its targets, we are on track to meet ours. In fact, we are achieving this because of many initiatives, including being a global leader in electric vehicle production, working with industry instead of against them, such as our government's investment in green steel at the FASCO Hamilton and our historic investments in conservation and, at the same time, 
holding polluters to account with increased fines and tough emission performance standards. Proud of our record, we are getting it done in the fight against climate. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. In fact, Speaker, this government should be embarrassed by its targets and by its efforts to date. The climate crisis is driving up the price of food and insurance. People see it in their grocery bills, they see it in their insurance bills. As we've seen in the past month with hurricanes in the United States, global heating is deadly and can cause destruction in the billions of dollars. We've already seen the impact of forest fires on Northern and First Nations communities disrupting their lives and destroying homes. How bad does it have to get before this government will take the effective action that we need now? Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery and Procurement. Mr. Speaker, Premier Ford has said, and I agree, we can be both strong stewards of the environment while building the Ontario of tomorrow. That's what this government stands for. We can tackle climate change while building the Ontario of tomorrow and creating the conditions for economic success and prosperity for all. That's why we've welcomed more than 800,000 new jobs to Ontario under our time in government thus far since 2018. And I can tell you what's driving up the price of everything, including groceries, is the regressive Liberal carbon tax supported by the NDP in Ottawa. Call your cousins in Ottawa and tell them to bring down that corrupt Liberal government in Ottawa. Again, I'll remind the members to make their comments through the chair. The next question, the member for Haldeman Norfolk. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. This summer, the minister arrived in Norfolk County unannounced for a photo op. And I'm curious if the minister actually drove through Haldeman County and across the Argyle Street Bridge in Caledonia. Had he, I'm certain reconstruction would have begun the very next day. Rather, this government continues to dither and delay. Last Tuesday at 5 p.m., I received notice that at 9 the next morning, the bridge would be closed for three days for inspection. Oh, my stars. Everyone knows this 100-year-old bridge is in critical state. It needs reconstruction, not inspection. But, Speaker, this government is inspecting the bridge continually to ensure that it is still safe to traverse. That is frightening. This is now my fifth time standing in this House asking the same question, and yet this government is playing ru Russian roulette with the lives of the people crossing that bridge. Speaker, through you to the minister, what is the date of reconstruction? To reply, the Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. As the member knows, the detailed design of the bridge replacement is complete, and that a government is in the process of obtaining final approvals to proceed to construction. But, M Mr. Speaker, we're in this situation because for 15 years, the members of the opposition who were in power, the Liberals, did absolutely nothing to build this province. They didn't build roads. They didn't build highways. They don't believe in building highways. They don't believe in building roads and bridges. And our government is committed to doing that. And that project is a part of our plan to build Ontario and a part of our plan to build and support Norfolk County, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker. And we will continue to do that. I'll work with the member and the members of the community to ensure that we get that done. Thank you. And the supplementary, back to the member for Haldeman Norfolk. Thank you, Speaker. And no disrespect, but nobody cares whose fault it is. You are the government of the day. Get the job done. So if the minister isn't willing to commit to a reconstruction date, then let's go down the road from the Argyle Street Bridge to Haldebrook Road and Highway 6. Ministry staff recently met with Haldeman County to discuss this very deadly intersection. And the minister has in his inbox a letter dated October 18 from the county emphasizing the urgency of installing traffic lights. I have here straight from the notes of the MTO project status briefing, which says construction is planned for 2028, subject to approvals being received and relocation of existing utilities being completed. 2028, I've sent the minister a list of the accidents at Highway 6 and Haldebrook Road, and sadly, 10 people have lost their lives over the past two years at this intersection. And again, this government is going to dither and delay until 2028. Question. Isn't this the government that created the Ministry of Red Tape Reduction? Yeah. Speaker, through you to the minister, how many lives must be lost at this deadly intersection before this government makes this a priority? Minister of Transportation. Uh, Mr. Speaker, building 
across this province is government's priority, and those projects are very much a part of this, as a member knows. We are going to continue to work and look at all across Ontario, especially those communities that the member has mentioned, and make those a part of our plan, as we have in the past. This is the only government that believes in building and believes in getting shovels in the ground. That member and others have voted against many of the projects that we have put forward in our budgets and in government to support more investments into road infrastructure, into bridges. Um, Madam Speaker, we're Mr. Speaker, we're just introduced legislation that will allow us to designate even more projects to go to 24-7 construction, find ways to get shovels in the ground quicker and faster. This is a government that gets it done, and we will work uh, not only with a member but those in the community to ensure that we continue to build the infrastructure that supports the Response. community and for generations to come. Yeah. The next question, the member for Flamborough Glanbrook. And good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. October is Women's History Month. This month, we reflect on women's significant achievements and contributions to this country while recognizing the unique obstacles women have had to overcome. While significant progress has been made, there is still more to be done to help attract more women to pursue good-paying careers in the skilled trades. Our government must continue working on behalf of all women Order. to implement measures that reduce those obstacles. Speaker, will the Associate Minister please tell this House what actions our government is taking to help women get the skills they need to achieve the success that they deserve. Here, here. Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the wonderful member from Flamborough Grand Book for his, what she's doing, especially on the global scale, to bring awareness of how Ontario is working to end human trafficking and intimate partner violence. Thank you for doing that. But, Mr. Speaker, over the summer I've been quite busy going around to different locations and announcing the $26.7 million in the Women's Economic Security Program. This program is significant because it's helping women who are low income get the skills and training needed to get a job, a really well-paying job, especially in the skilled trades. I was in Burlington with the member from Burlington talking about the carpentry program at the Burlington Skills Centre and listening to the stories of women whose lives have been changed because now they are able to afford to take care of themselves, get a housing, and be able to purchase a vehicle to just get to and from work. And Mr. Speaker, these women are saying that they feel so much more secure. Response. And I want to make sure that we're continuing to do this because we know that when women are financially independent, they are safer. Here, here. And that's the kind of future we're creating for women in Ontario, and we're going to keep doing this for women as well. well. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Our province is facing the biggest labour shortage in over a generation. Every day, roughly tens of thousands of jobs are going unfilled in Ontario, costing this province billions in lost productivity. Speaker, our government knows that women are a big part of the solution. Here, here. It's critical that we do everything we can to attract more women to pursue fulfilling and good-paying careers in the skilled trades. Speaker, will the Associate Minister please share more details on how our government is breaking down barriers and helping women right across Ontario to develop the skills that they need to enter these in-demand careers? The Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, the programs that I mentioned, like the Women's Economic Security Program, that has 25 locations across Ontario, uh, 26.7 million, but also the Investing in Women's Futures Program that has 33 locations across Ontario. It means removing the, the barriers that are preventing women from being able to engage in these programs, addressing food insecurity, addressing childcare barriers, addressing all the things that are preventing women from being able to be in the driver's seat of their economic future. And Mr. Speaker, these programs are working. We've seen over 10,000 women engage in these programs and getting jobs, and they are feeling secure because they're now able to take care of their families. And Mr. Speaker, we're doing this as a whole of government approach as well, working with the Ministry of Labor, Immigration, Training, and Skills Development. They've reported that we've seen an increase of 51% 
of women in the skilled trades since we took office in Spons. 2018. That is significant. We haven't seen increases in women in the skilled trades like this in decades. But this is what our government's doing because we know women are the future. And we know the. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Ottawa, Chris McKeon. Thank you, Speaker. Violence is an urgent and growing crisis in our schools. Classrooms are being disrupted daily, and behaviors like kicking, hitting, biting, and throwing objects have become part of the everyday routine of school. Some educators are going to work every single day in Kevlar. This violence is preventable because it's being driven by the failure of an underfunded education system to meet the needs of every child. So today, for parents and students who are concerned about this violence, and for the educators who are going to school in military-grade equipment, Will the Minister of Education commit to implementing our emergency plan to end school violence, yes or no? Reply, the Minister of Education. Well, Speaker, as a mother of three, I understand firsthand how important it is to send your child to a safe, nurturing environment. As a former educator in the post-secondary sector, I understand the care that all educators take to ensure that their classrooms are welcome environments that allow students to be their best selves. And as the Minister of Education, I know that we must all play a collective role to support and safeguard our schools, whether it's teachers, parents, school boards, principals, vice principals, educational assistants, lunchroom monitors, guidance counselors, local community supports. These are the people who care about our, our teachers and our students in the class. And speaking with all of these individuals in the past few months, it is abundantly clear that we all agree violence is never acceptable in our schools. That's why my ministry will continue to invest over $220 million for student safety and well-being, including for special education. Bonds. And I know that's something the NDP has never stood behind us. The supplementary question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you very much, Speaker. Ontario's education workers love their students, but they shouldn't have to endure physical violence as a routine part of their job. The right to a safe workplace also includes people working in schools. The Conservative government has the power to make the changes and investments needed to end school violence, but instead they defunded our students by $1,500 per student. They're out of ideas, or they simply don't care, Speaker. But fortunately, to Democrats, we met with families, we met with education workers, and they developed our plan to end school violence. They've asked us to bring it forward. My question, Speaker, was the Conservative government implement the emergency plan to end school violence so that Ontario's children and our educators can learn and work in safety. Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, violence is never acceptable in our classrooms. But, Speaker, when it comes to student safety, the NDP's report card on this subject shows there is a clear lack of understanding and an inability to grasp the basic concepts when it comes to student safety in Ontario. They voted against investing over $58 million to school boards for student safety and well-being. This is money that specifically is allocated to protecting our students and our teachers in the classrooms. But, Speaker, the opposition didn't just vote against core funding. Every time we invest in student safety, the NDP simply says no. The NDP says no to $4.2 million to prevent bullying and cyberbullying, which I'm going to hope they will support Bill 94, my colleague's cybersecurity bill, uh, $1 million to enhance supports Spons. across the province, $1.5 million for anti-hate initiatives. Speaker, if the NDP stopped playing using mental math when playing their politics, they would realize that they have voted against every single measure that supports student safety in our Order. classrooms across Ontario. The next question. The member for Bay of Quinty. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Gaming. Ontario's tourism sector is a cornerstone of our economy, attracting millions of visitors each year and showcasing our province's incredible diversity and beauty. However, in many, for many in the industry are still facing challenges in their recovery from the pandemic, with labour shortages, rising costs and competition from other regions being ongoing concerns. Tourism operators and local businesses are looking to our government for clear leadership and support, especially in regions that depend heavily on seasonal visitors and tourism dollars like Prince Edward County in my home riding of Bay of Quinte. 
These operators need to know that our government will have their backs and that we will support them with long-term growth and resilient strategy. Speaker, can the minister please explain what our government is doing to support Ontario's tourism industry? Thank you. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Gaming. Thank you, Speaker. First of all, wow, so much better looking than the last member for Bay of Quinte. <laughs> Uh, Speaker, you know, last night I joined Minister Lumsden at Tim Hortons Field. Uh, you know, I know the minister here has a great cup championship under his belt, but I was there for the Tourism Summit uh, to talk with the Tourism Industry Association of Ontario about the importance of tourism and what a big economic driver it is here in the province of Ontario. Speaker, Ontario's a big province, and I know the Liberals get nosebleeds north of Eglinton Avenue, but the reality is Ontario can fit 14 European countries inside of its borders, has two time zones, and goes to the third coast, Speaker. That is, of course, the Arctic Ocean through James Bay, which we are connecting through the Northlander we are bringing back in a couple of years. Speaker, that's why this government invests $155 million into this vital sector, including into that member's riding through a series of investments, because we understand tourism is hugely important in the province of Ontario. Thank you, Speaker. Ontario is indeed blessed with natural wonders and a rich cultural landscape that draws millions of visitors each year. From Niagara Falls to the bustling streets of Toronto to my communities of Belleville and Quinney West, the potential for growth in our tourism sector is undeniable. However, as we look beyond the immediate recovery from the pandemic, it's crucial that we consider how Ontario can position itself on the global stage in a highly competitive tourism market. While our government is committed to making Ontario a world-class destination, many are asking how this vision will translate into action on the ground. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on the long-term outlook for tourism in Ontario? Minister of Tourism, Culture and Gaming. Uh, speaker, well, locally, we've invested over $600,000 last fiscal into that member's riding to support tourism. But he asked a very important question. How do we promote tourism uh, more broadly? Now, we have a lot to offer in this province. Not only do we have four beautiful seasons. We have natural beauty, colors on the leaves changing astonishingly, visitors coming from all over the world. The seventh natural wonder of the world in Niagara Falls. Speaker, you know my personal story. My mom, beautiful lady. My dad, not so beautiful. She only said yes to marry him because he said, I can show you Niagara Falls. That's the kind of draw we have in this province. That is what we're going to promote. We're going to continue to put the pieces of the puzzle together. This government is getting it done for tourism in Ontario. Our question period for this morning.